Ram is good. Rom is good. Platinum tro- Oh no. Well, we have to fix that. Welcome everyone. Today we have a special episode. We're gonna platinum GTA 3 the definitive edition. There's 29 trophies for us to collect. A handful of them are gonna be story related. Others will require me to complete side activities and grab collectibles. I'll aim for efficiency and try to get everything on my first playthrough, even the missable story ones. I'm gonna need to 100% the game when it's all said and done. I will be discussing the plot of this game, so spoiler warning. Other than that, let's get into it. Our game instantly kicks off with some action. The protagonist Claude and his fellow crime partners are fleeing a bank robbery. Out of nowhere, his Bonnie counterpart Catalina suddenly turns on him. Sorry babe, I'm an ambitious girl. Small time. Dude, bummer. Yep, we have ourselves a revenge plot. Fast forward some time and we see a convoy transporting our guy to start serving his prison sentence. That is until the city's Colombian gang decides to play Mario Kart with the bomb and intercept the convoy. Senor Dickhead. They greet Officer Dickhead as Mr. Dickhead in Spanish and kidnap the old oriental gentleman. This gives Claude and fellow criminal 8-Ball the chance to escape. One bomb explosion later and we started our first mission. Since his hands are all messed up, 8-Ball insists brother Claude gets behind the wheel. He then proceeds to open the car door with his hands anyways. As we make our way down the Callahan Bridge, I'm filled with nothing but good memories of what's to come from this playthrough. I've played this game multiple times since I was about 6 or 7. If I remember correctly, it was my first PS2 game ever. Shout out to my family for getting me this crime sim at a young age. It kept me off the streets and turned me into a productive member of society. Once I drop off Claude and 8-Ball at the Portland safe house to get a change of threads, we'll make our way to a connected member in the Liberty City Mafia, Luigi. He's voiced by the legendary Joe Pantoliano. I love this role as Ralph Cifaretto from The Sopranos. He wants us to pick up Misty, one of his who was, from the hospital and bring her back to the club. This is a simple task. I make my way to Misty, drive her back quickly, getting my first trophy, first day on the job. Before we continue with the story, I'm gonna get a lot of busy work out the way. The real GTA OGs know this game is a nightmare to 100% the further you progress into the story. This will consist of doing as many of the side activities as possible before progressing at specific points. The activities required for 100% completion are the following. Dropping off 100 fares in the taxi side activity. Passing paramedic level 12. Completing the vigilante side activity. Completing the firefighter side activity. Passing all the RC toy destruction missions, beating all the off-roading vehicle missions, delivering all the required vehicles for the import-export list, finishing all 20 rampages, nailing all 20 unique stunt jumps, and lastly, finding 100 of the good old hidden packages. Some of these have individual trophies tied to them. They're all essential in conjunction with the main story missions to get 100% completion for the Platinum. First up, Taxi Missions. I'm gonna knock out 100 fares in Portland for the Where To trophy. It's not difficult as you don't have to do all the fares consecutively. Just grindy. Well, it's safe to say that we got our work cut out for us. Since we'll be doing honest work for a minute, we may as well get the tunes right. This game has some fantastic music, by the way. The high energy MSX FM is ahead of its time. Filled to the brim with jungle music, it makes me want to throw a rave with molotovs instead of fancy lights. Want to go on a date to the opera but you're broke? Put on double clef FM, light up some candles, have dinner with your significant other at the dinner table. There's really no difference. Feeling scarfacey? Well she's on fire and so is flashback 95.6. Unfortunately, we never thought the sequel to this game would be set in a place where this radio station would be a perfect fit. I sometimes like to find that Vice City billboard and just imagine. KJI Radio makes me channel my inner Ross Trent and embrace parts of me I didn't know I had. All the songs here are from The Scientist and his 1981 album Scientist Rids the World of the Evil Curse of the Vampires. He has some unique album artwork and sentences for almost all his albums. Rise FM is the actual music of aliens. If I had a UFO, I would pull up on the intergalactic baddies with this blasting out the windows. The trance and house mixture of music here is what Samurai Jack had to fight through in that one episode. You know, why don't you just pick game radio for your hip hop fix? I guarantee that after 15 minutes, you'll be yelling out, Stretch Armstrong is now in your world. 
world, so world. I didn't realize it until now, but Royce the 5'9 has a handful of tracks here. They all sound great. Maybe you don't want music. Perhaps you're a podcast, just vocals kind of guy. Well, I got good news for you. The crazy denizens of LC do not hesitate to give their incredible takes on Chatterbox FM. They're equal parts fascinating as well as disturbing. An excellent runner up for my favorite is Head Radio. It's like emotional pop music, but for robots that like the occasional beeps and boops. Some of these songs have a sim like touch, making for catchy tunes, but you really can't make out the lyrics until you look them up. Of course, my heart truly lies with one station. The catchiness and funk of it just fill my heart with joy. All I have to do is play this soundbite. And look, look at that. I got you feeling a certain way. There's a reason why it just sits at the top all lonely. I'm Tyrone, and I came to fuck these other radio stations' wives long dick style. These are all great stations, each worthy of your time. I haven't gotten to the funny commercials like Pogo the Monkey or Pets Overnight. And wait, what's this station over here? That's strange. Might be a new one with this edition. I never heard this. Let, let's check it out. While doing these taxi missions, I'll get acquainted with the first of the three islands this game has to offer. We begin our journey in Portland. This is more of the working class, industrial part of the city. It's probably my least favorite of the three, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't the most realized portion of the map. Every space here has its use, making it the perfect place for starting a playthrough. There's criminals, gangs, and just overall CD people around every corner. Landmark wise, Portland offers a pretty big dockyard, modest neighborhoods, and public transit everywhere from taxis, buses, and even trains that operate above and below ground. The visuals for this definitive edition are all right. It's far from perfect, especially with the specific character models. I do like the lighting and some of the texture work. It can be a little hit or miss in some places. I wholeheartedly welcome the quality of life features though, such as mission checkpoints, radio and weapon wheels, the lack of loading screens, even the vehicle spawns being fixed are welcome to me. Out of the three games that got the update, GTA 3 definitely benefited the most. Having a map screen when you pause the game is a godsend. However, the product we got here does leave much more to be desired, especially when it's launched back in 2021. But truth be told, Rockstar could have handled this way better than what was delivered overall. And honestly, I think that... Hey, check it out. I got my second trophy for completing my 100th fare. My in-game reward is the fantastic Borg 9 taxi. As a little kid, I thought this was a taxi, but you know, like, from hell. Next, I worked on the paramedic missions. They're passenger quests similar to taxi missions, but require you to carefully drop off patients at the hospital. Every round, you gain an additional person to pick up. The ambulance can only seat three people, so you have to develop a route to pick up the extra bodies. By the time you get to the last round, you'll have to retrieve 12 patients at once. So as a disclaimer, I've 100 percent at this game a handful of times. The one time I tried to record footage for content, I swear the forces of Liberty City were against me. Whether it was crazy drivers hitting me, causing me to flip over, me accidentally running over patients because time wasn't on my side, or even this. What the fuck is this? I persisted and eventually got it though. 78 patients later, I got health and adrenaline at my safe house while also unlocking unlimited stamina. This transformed my lungs from a third grader with asthma to an Olympic runner with a trophy to top it all off. After that ordeal of a trophy, I decided to take a break from my blue collar life and work on some collectibles and less stressful side missions. Hidden packages. What's in them? I'm assuming cash and other sorts of illegal paraphernalia. I've narrowed it down to either two things, deli sandwiches or gun parts. There are a hundred of them spread across the game and split amongst the three cities. Every 10 you gather, you'll unlock an item spawn at your safe house, which is actually really helpful. We can't get all 100 in one go though. Each island is locked off and won't be accessible until we progress the story. When I was done with Portland's packages, I had collected 31. This unlocked pistols, Uzis, and grenades at my safe house. Rampages are the things I worked on next.
next. They're a simple, mindless activity. Walk into the skull icon and kill the highlighted gang members with the selected weapon within the time limit. The difficulties for rampages can vary. Some range from a jolly good time to oh my god, I just signed a death wish and I'm about to meet my maker. Few and far between, but still difficult nonetheless. While doing the Portland rampages, I unlocked my fourth trophy, Street Sweeper, for wasting 100 gang members. You know, there's been an uptick in crime that needs to be addressed. Being the career man I am, I take it upon myself to stop these criminals. Who needs Spider-Man when you have Claude with an Uzi? The vigilante mission scratched that itch. You're supposed to ram the vehicle and stop the suspects when they flee, but forget that. We're playing Grand Theft Auto, not please stop that. Guns are the solution to everything we do here. Crime against crime is the only rationale. A clutch unlock you get from this activity is the police bribe. For every 10 you achieve out of the required 60, you unlock these babies at your safe house to use anytime. They're a quick way to drop your wanted levels if you can't reduce them by other means like the pain spray. If you're like me and know these virtual cities better than your real life ones, you can remember where they're placed on the in-game map and utilize those as needed. I'll soon unlock my fifth trophy, going rogue, for ridding the city of 15 doit balls in one consecutive run. I need to cool it because I'm on fire with all these trophies. Yeah, I couldn't think of a remarkable transition to this activity. I need to keep the citizens of LC safe from all the sporadic fires that suddenly break out when I operate a fire truck. There's nothing more euphoric than she's on fire playing while you're actually putting out fires around the city. I'll also give these strange tunnel hobos a much needed shower. Eventually, I'll get my sixth trophy, Splish Splash, for doing 15 fires in one run. Earlier I mentioned how the vehicle spawns in this new addition to GTA 3 are better. This directly benefits the next activity I'll start, imports and exports. Both Portland and Shoreside Veil vale demand specific vehicles. You have to find them and deliver them to their respective garages. Both want 16 cars apiece. There's also a demand for specific emergency vehicles that we'll have to provide in Portland. Some of the cars can be found on the road where you regularly explore. Still, others require you to look in very specific locations. That part alone can make doing this task effortless quite frustrating. I remember playing the original version back in the day on the PS2 and not seeing a quarter of these vehicles because they just would never spawn. Certain vehicles like the FBI car require a flawless strategy as they only spawn under certain conditions. The guys you're facing here will obliterate you, so you have to know what you're doing. While dropping cars off at the Portland garage, I established generational wealth by earning the millionth dollar, netting the dirty money trophy. <laughs> The RC destruction missions and off-road events are tasks leaning more toward the easier side of things. The RC missions are as mindless as they get. You have a remote control car that explodes when you crash into vehicles. Your targets are always going to be specific gangs around the city, more specifically the cars that they drive. The off-road missions require a bit more skill and patience. You enter a unique vehicle and must make your way through scattered checkpoints within a given time limit. You get bonus time for each checkpoint collected. Figuring out the best path is pretty trial and error. I go through them slowly at first and give it a couple tries. Eventually, I'll get the first one done. Moving on, I'll pursue my dream of becoming a daredevil. I'll complete the 8 stunt jumps scattered around Portland. These are meditative to me. They make me think about life when flying through the air in slow motion. If I could teleport to different universes, I'd travel to Liberty City in 2001. Why? Dude, I'd become a paid swim instructor and give lessons to everyone here. Think about it, I'd make millions. This trophy was for landing a perfect insane stunt. It's an acknowledgement that the game gives you anytime you get wicked air, pretty much. Whew, all the side work here in Portland is done. After building my community up like this, there's only one thing left to do. Get everyone to hate me. Did that hooker just dive cancel into a seduce? Luigi said earlier he has some more work for us. Let's swing by and see what's up. He gives us several small time jobs, some requiring our muscle, some requiring our driving skills. It's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. Luckily for him, Claude is the right fit for every single one. His simple mission structure is a basic tutorial for controlling Claude, but more importantly, how you as the player interact with the game world. Like in Don't Spank My Bitch Up, you learn about the melee combat by acquiring the bat. You'll need this weapon to deal with those pesky foes that might cause you a bit of trouble. 
I ran the guy over with my car. My favorite mission from his set is the fuzzball. You can see this game allowing moments of agency in your mission approach. The cops are celebrating at City Hall. They could use some action. That's where you come in. You need to deliver the local who was and satisfy those customers. With eight of them to pick up, you think that you would just have to make multiple trips with a regular four-door vehicle, but there's a better solution. We'll tactically acquire this vessel and horrify it to satisfy our clients at the ball, and after disinfecting it, I'll get my knife trophy for pure innovation. My excellent work connects us with the Don's son, Joey Leone, who later requests our services. I wonder what kind of work he has for us. You see, Joey has the great fortune of being voiced by Michael Rappaport. Mod is a weird fucking straight cat outside! It looks... It looks like grandma the fucking thing! Yeah, he's a remarkable person. You always see Joey working on this BF injection. It should have been fixed by the end of his mission chain, but he probably takes the hot rod approach to repairing vehicles. Alright, alright, I'll be respectful to him. He is the Don's son. I don't want his posse to do a 187 in my ass or anything. His missions involve us being a wheelman for higher profile work, to include a heist. Some will require you to execute certain people, like Mike Lips Ferrelli or Chunky Lee Chong. In Mike's Lips last lunch, we have to arm Mike's car with the 8 ball kablooey device and return it on our first attempt without damaging it. The result is fireworks with the side of a trophy. Farewell Chunky Lee Chong is an infamous mission in the game, not because of what the developers scripted to happen, but because of what you can do yourself. You see, you have to take out Chunky Lee Chong in Chinatown. When you approach him, he'll make an escape to his nearby car. This means you have to chase him down with your own car and kill him and drag this mission out. But if you channel your inner Raven Baxter, you'll know the outcome. So what would happen if you took the getaway vehicle, blessed it with the bomb, return it, and then initiated the chase? Humanity evolves and your trophy collection gets bigger. Man, we're flying through these Joey missions, I... Is that a ringing phone? Hmm. Is this the Krusty Krab? No, this is Patrick. No Patrick here, but we do have a fascinating fella, Marty Chonks. He speaks like he has an offer for me he can't refuse. He runs the bitchin' dog food factory and has some stuff he needs to hash out with specific people. I suppose he needs assistance in facilitating focus groups for his new dog food flavors. I accept. This kind soul wants to involve his bank manager, a pair of honorable thieves, his wife, and a generous moneylender with whom his wife is friends with. He also asked me to disguise or hide the vehicles after I drop off each person. Someone is a fan of a scavenger hunt. While assisting Mr. Chonks, I became a certified crusher operator and received my 12th trophy. Sadly, the wife's friend performed a hostile takeover and took the business for himself, killing Marty in the process. So long, Marty. It was nice knowing you. I should get out of here. Wait a minute, there's no dogs in this game. Let's just end our day by going home and saving. We earned a day off. I've actually put in so much work that I earned a trophy for getting a criminal score of 2,500 points while resting. A criminal score is just a summary of how much of a bad boy you've been. Apparently I'm up there. Another day means another chance to terrorize the citizens of Liberty City. While working the rest of Joey's missions, I ended up getting a notification from someone who claimed to be El Buto. He wants to talk with us? <sighs> As if. That star is too busy making quality movies to just reach out to strangers. I'll entertain it though and see what's up. Whoa, no way, it's him. It's really him. Dude, I'm an avid fan of yours. I just finished my Donkey Does Dallas collection. I have all three vol- <coughs> Yeah, I heard of you. What you want? His speech is full of NSFW innuendos. He pretty much wants you to carry out his perverted bidding. His first mission is a good old fashioned race through the streets. We'll just get a fast car, smoke our inept competition, and win the trophy, figuratively and literally, for beating the race in under three minutes. Like I mentioned before, the rest of his missions involve you supporting his business endeavors in one way or another. Whether that's torching some triads and getting them to permanently hate you, feeding the mafia a healthy dose of ice cream, which is really explosions, or just picking up his stolen merch and helping distribute it. Oh hey, look at that, he's giving us a copy of his latest material. I'm totally not going to read that later when nobody is looking. 
All right, let's get back on track with our main story. While working for Joey, we get a new mission contact, Tony Cipriani. You see, Tony can't help but be impressed with how we handle the bank heist and animal rights activists wanting to kill us over a dead skunk in the trunk. Voiced by Michael Madsen, Tony wants our help to deal with the triads encroaching on his business and bottom line. His missions primarily focus on messing up all the triad operations. With this physique, ties to the mob and psycho mom, Tony reminds me of a particular fella I knew. He really liked Gabagool and didn't have the making of a varsity athlete though. During the mission triads and tribulations, we have to kill some triad warlords while keeping both mafia team members alive. Once we reach the end of the mission, we'll get a trophy. My favorite mission from him is definitely the finale, also known as Blowfish. Things are at a boiling point. Tony wants us to finish off the triad operations. He has us take a trash truck, rig it with the bomb, and blow up the gang's fish factory. Apart from this being a permanent change in the world, Tony also says maybe my favorite line of the game. I want it to rain mackerel. We're talking real biblical here. Nothing low budget good stuff. Tony and many other characters in this game would be given more story and development in a future prequel game. GTA Liberty City Stories. In this game, you actually play as Tony himself and partake in events that occurred years before the events of GTA 3. Working for Tony has gotten us a direct line to the Don himself, Salvatore Leone. Voiced by the phenomenal Frank Vincent, he strikes me as the kind of guy who would eat grilled cheese off a radiator. With him calling the shots for the family, he's seen all that you've done so far. He decides to have you assist him with more significant opportunities operations, but first, he wants you to babysit his wife. In comes Maria, who's probably innocent and far from being the most troubling person to deal with. Yeah, major sarcasm. Heck, even in their introductory mission, Chaperone, she has you going around trying to score drugs and even has you take her to a party that would end up getting raided. Let's just hope it stops there and she doesn't say or do anything to put our lives in danger. The rest of Salvatore's missions are directed towards halting the production of Colombian Spank. Spank is essentially a street drug that's being pushed around. He has you ice out a rat for giving the Colombians information while also collaborating with 8ball to blow up a vessel that's being used for spank operations. The mission is oddly divided into two acts, one consisting of a cutscene and the other actually being the mission. You need 100k? Uh. I guess I could spare some change for this. Me and 8ball head to the ship where I lay down protective fire for him to rig the bomb. He has zero patience, so you better get these shots off quick. Once it's placed, he makes his escape. I like his running animation. I don't know how to describe it other than he runs like a flightless bird, kind of like an ostrich or something. With this ship permanently removed from the map, we celebrate at Salvatore's. He gives us a quick fetch quest and even promised to have us made when it's all said and done. When we get close to the car, we get a surprise message. Oh, you don't say, Maria. Well, it turns out that the car is a death trap. I'll tell you guys one thing, and I'm not ashamed to say it. My estimation of Salvatore Leone as a man just fucking plummeted. I place my grenade face down and end my turn. Maria insists we meet her and her friend Asuka at the docks. Asuka, who's Yakuza affiliated, gives us asylum and work with her organization in the neighboring city, Staunton Island. After dropping them off, I'll unlock my next trophy for completing the last request mission and also transition to the next part of the game. Dude, Claude, that's sick. This park is a place for families. Welcome to Staunton Island, the business district of Liberty City. It's heavily populated and much more dense. You don't interact with it as much as you do Portland, but I think it makes up more than enough with the spectacle alone. You have a football stadium, a college campus, a construction site, this game's equivalent to New York's Times Square, and a community park just to name some landmarks. Most of the inhabitants dress nicer and drive fancier vehicles as well. I think we'll settle in just fine. The first vehicle we get into gives us a new report on a bridge from Portland to Staunton Island. Engineers have been working around the clock to get traffic flowing between Portland and Staunton Island once again. It was repaired from the bomb explosion. It gives the impression of a world that develops even when you're not there. I also love that there's no loading times for transitioning between both islands. You learn how well connected they are, whether it's by bridge, boat, tunnel, or even underground subway. Alright, back to business. I prioritized getting the collectibles and side missions done before progressing the story. We don't have to worry about the taxi or paramedic missions, so I won't bring those up until the end when I'm recapping the 100%. I decided to get the available hidden packages first, bringing my total from 31 to 
to 68. The unlocks I have at my safe house now are shotguns, Molotov cocktails, and personally the best one I think, body armor. I completed 7 rampages, totaling for an amount of 13 done, and nailed 4 stunt jumps, making it 12 of those finished so far. I won't progress much on the imports and exports since the other garage is in the third city. I did deliver 3 more, going from 17 to 20 out of the 38 required. Moving on to the side missions, I extinguished 20 more fires and stopped 20 criminals on this new island. This allowed me to get 2 more police bribes at my safe house. Lastly, I'll do the available RC toys and off-roading missions. The same deal applies to the RC ones, find gang cars and blow them up. I'm now up to 3 out of 4 as far as completion goes for them. I do like these off-road missions more than the ones with the Patriots. They seem more focused and smaller scale, especially the multi-story mayhem one. Use the parking lot as an obstacle course and finish the challenge off in style. Finishing ride in the park puts my off-road mission count to 3 out of 4. Alright, all the side stuff has been taken care of, let's continue the story. Meeting back up with Asuka, she agrees to a partnership with us under the condition that we cut our ties with the Mafia and kill Salvatore. Simple enough. Legend on the street is that Salvatore actually wanted a compromise. He wants a compromise? How's this? I wanted to spare him, maybe set him up with 20 years in the can. I compromised and gave him a quick trip to hell. This grants me the ire of the Mafia who will stop at nothing to kill me if they see me. The rest of Asuka's mission set has us handling her personal affairs, mainly dealing with various assassinations. Her mission set is alright, nothing too special. Through her missions though, we get connected to three other contacts. Her brother Kenji, who's also affiliated with the Yakuza and owns a casino, Ray, who's a corrupt police officer and has ties within the organization itself, and King Courtney, leader of the Yardies gang. He pages us though and has no tie to the Yakuza. Kenji speaks with an undeniably funny lisp. It's almost distracting when watching the cutscenes. Same, a man once did me a favor, and I've never had the opportunity to repay his kindness. The man's weakness is- He gives us more high profile work, including busting a colleague out of jail, making routine collections from businesses, and actually committing Grand Theft Auto with sports cars. I know, I can't believe it, I said the title of the game. They're pretty entertaining to be honest. There's one infamous cutscene where Kenji scolds you for his plan falling through. He wanted you to stop the Colombians and Yardies from working working together, which was successfully done in the previous mission deal steal. Still, he shifts the blame to you and whines with his annoying lisp. You, how fitting you should choose this moment to sow your worthless faith. It would appear your attempts to dissuade the Jamaicans from becoming bedfellows with the cartel were wholly inadequate. Yardy pushes line Liberty Street selling packets of spank like they were selling hot dogs. Chill out man, you do not need to come at me talking like Sylvester from Looney Tunes. In fact, you're gonna get yours one day. I'll make sure of it. During this final mission, he wants us to waste Yardy dealers pushing Spank on the streets as quickly as possible. I also got my 17th trophy escape artist for using my 20th police bribe while doing this. Once we finish Kenji's missions, we'll move on to the next set with Ray. Since Ray is corrupt, he's pretty paranoid. He has you meet him in a public restroom to avoid any suspicion. In fact, the first mission that introduces us to him from Asuka, we had to answer random payphones within a specific time limit around the city before we actually came face to face with him. Overall, his missions ramp up the absurdity in action. You'll be chasing down witnesses and other corrupt crooks. I can't decide which of the two missions I like more between Arm Shortage or Plaster Blaster. Plaster Blaster is just plain over the top. It turns out the person you were supposed to kill and silence the sneak ended up surviving. So now you have to find the ambulance transporting him, extract him, and then find out a way to destroy him while he's in this cast. Explosives don't work so you have to use your wheels pretty much. If I had to pick, I'd lean more towards arm shortage. It's on the shorter side, but I don't really mind. Ray wants you to assist his crazy gun nut friend Phil Cassidy. This crazy dude is a military veteran with many cameos in the 3D GTA games. He needs your help fending off the Colombians, which is a breeze once you get the right weapons. Completing this mission also gives you easier access to heavy weapons, like the M16 which shreds just about anything it touches, the rocket launcher, which I mean come on man it's a bazooka, and lastly the rhino, which is actually required for the dock's emergency vehicle list. There's a tedious way to unlock it which involves you pushing it to your safe house, but I'll just wait until the end of the game when I unlock it after beating the story. Working with Ray connects us to Donald Love. I don't even know where to start with this ending 
enigmatic guy. Still, before we begin his crazy and pretty complex mission chain, we'll tackle the King Courtney phone missions. King Courtney is interested in us and wants us to prove that we could roll with his Yardie crew. His missions are nothing too out of the ordinary. They range from a relay race where checkpoint spawns are randomized and scattered, a mission where you have to do drive-bys on the Diablo gang in Portland, which gets them to hate our guts permanently, and a car pickup request that ends up turning into an ambush with suicide bombers. Yeah, nothing unusual here. All jokes aside, this Kingdom Come mission will give any first time player a run for their money. What makes this bitch of a mission even sweeter is we learned that King Courtney and Catalina were both in on it. She even wrote a love note. How nice. Hopefully you have some long range weapons and a rocket launcher on you to take on these crazies. After destroying this last van, I'll get my 18th trophy, a gift from the king. This is for completing all the King Courtney phone missions and gaining the disapproval of the Yardy gang members all over Liberty City. So, with almost every gang wanting me dead and nothing else to live for, I go to visit Donald Love. He's a well-established figure in most of the GTA games in different capacities. Earlier, I mentioned him as enigmatic and a weird guy overall. The best way to describe his behavior would be sociopathic. He's a disconnected billionaire that sees the world as a sandbox and the people who exist in it to do his bidding. He wants what he wants and he doesn't question it. It's his lack of conscience that does it for me. Boy oh boy does this game turn up difficulty for his stuff. His missions require you to go against some formidable forces. His first mission is a simple rescue. He wants you to retrieve the old oriental gentleman that was nabbed by the Colombians at the beginning of the game. It's his buddy. It's a simple enough rescue anyways. Then it just escalates to new levels of crazy. He wants you to kill Kenji of the Yakuza and frame it in a way that puts the Colombians at fault to start a gang war. All of this in turn will keep property values down and benefit him from a business standpoint. Honestly, I would feel bad if I had done this and not experienced that outburst from Kenji, but truth be told, he did have this coming working with a random outsider like Claude. Fluffery Fuckatash, I thought I saw a putty cat, headass. I'll unlock the following trophy for completing Donald's drop in the ocean mission, making it trophy 19. Grand Theft Arrow is definitely my favorite mission of his for two reasons. The first one is that we officially get access to the third and last island of the game, Shoreside Vale. And it is now open to traffic flow both to and from Shoreside Vale which I'll cover in a bit. The second reason is that it feels cinematic and has an excellent progression. You make your way to Francis International Airport to retrieve his package before the authorities do, but you see that the Colombians beat both of you there. After killing them and not finding the package, they left clues revealing where they could be located. This brings you back to Staunton Island and to the construction site in the southern part of town. In the actual construction site, Colombians are waiting to absolutely wreck you. Being slow and methodical is a must. I'm serious. They could strip off your armor and health in practically seconds. Even with me being careful, I missed one guy and he did not let me forget that. Talk about heart attack inducing. Once we make our way up the tower, we encounter our backstabbing girl Catalina and Miguel. We got their number, but Catalina decides to sacrifice homeboy and make an escape, Assassin's Creed style. Asuka catches up with you and is enraged. She believes that the cartel murdered her brother. We all know it was Claude who did it, however she doesn't know that, and she takes her frustration out on Miguel. At this point, she wants you to take the fight to the Colombians in what's pretty much considered a declaration of war. Claude, you're a cold dude, I swear. If the dollar amount is good enough, you might even turn on me. Let's return this package to Donald and complete his last two missions, escort service and decoy. Both of them are definitely difficult. Escort service is precisely what it sounds like, an escort mission. You protect the oriental gentleman on this one. He's driving an armored van filled with goods to a secure location from the Colombians. You'll be attacked by those same Colombian pursuers who'll stop at nothing to intercept it. There's also guys stationed at specific spots. You'll probably fail the mission a few times to remember where they spawn. These guys posted with machine guns could quickly build up damage. It came down to the wire for me. My car blew up in the end and I had to foot the rest of the way. I was good though. Completing this mission gets us a contact from Shoreside Vale. It's D-Ice from the Red Jacks. He's the leader of a gang in a nearby area. I'll get to him once I finish my business in Staunton. For Donald's last mission decoy, he wants us to create a distraction, while at the same time, he has the oriental gentleman carry a valuable package back to him. We'll get in the armor van and keep the police's attention for the allotted time without blowing the car up. Whoa, six stars? These guys mean business. They've never met a criminal like me. Wow. I was so scared that I would meet that tank again, I legitimately had no strategy and hoped the game would just have mercy on me. Which it did. Surprisingly, there were no tanks or FBI cars. They even huddled up in a formation and gave me a breather. This justice system is weird. Mission passed. 
That should give Donald a piece of my mind. He's really asking for a lot and offering little in return. I mean, a tank, dude. A warning would have been nice or something. Hey, fuckface, I... He's not here. Hmm. Okay. We'll get the mission pass theme, but no visual notification. Everything about that cutscene is just a little chilling to me. Whatever, let's move on to the end of this game. Welcome to Shoreside Vale. As I mentioned earlier, it's the third and last island of the game. I feel like most people dislike it, but it's charming to me. The airport with airplanes you can't interact with, excluding the one. I'll get to you in a bit. Don't you go flying off without me. The dam that's really big for no reason. The winding and sometimes confusing road structures with their indirect routes. This closed off tunnel that leads to a more rural part of Liberty City. The portion of the island you can't really be around because of deadly Colombians. It, it has magic to it. You just gotta look deep, trust me. Well, you better get used to it because we got plenty of busy work to accomplish here. I'll begin my stay here by finishing up the hidden packages around town. Getting all 100 got me a couple things. A buttload of cash, as if I really need that. AK-47s, sniper rifles, M16s, and a rocket launcher. All at my safe house to pick up whenever. The icing on top is me getting the 20th trophy, Liberty City Secrets. Next are the remaining rampages. Some of these definitely turn up the difficulty a couple notches if you ask me. The vehicle ones were easy, and even some of the weapon ones were more manageable, mindless fun. However, any rampage involving the Colombian cartel can go straight to hell. They're such a force to be reckoned with, dude. The sniper one was pretty easy though. They just stand around like the good NPCs they are. I got the 21st trophy Liberty City Minute during one of these final rampages. I kept my HP at 10 or less for a full minute. Once I behead my final hood, I'll be awarded a pointless $1 million and one step closer to 100%ing the game. Moving on to the rest of the stun jumps, aka my peace time in this crazy city, I'll finish up the 8 in Shoreside Vale while getting us another $1 million we'll never spend, and a lovely gold trophy to boot. Next, I decided to tackle the last off-road mission, Grip. A lot of people hate this mission, myself included. Just take it slow and never, ever use the handbrake on any of these checkpoints. Thank goodness for guys showing me the best possible path to take. Once this is done, my 100% progress with the off-road side missions will be complete. Now it's time to put on my undercover cop uniform one last time and protect Shoreside Vale from 20 criminals. It's been a pleasure serving this community and serving it safely while apprehending all criminals in such a lawful manner. Thank you, I'll take those two extra police bribes while I'm at it. After that, I took the opportunity to quickly wrap up the imports and exports for Shoreside and Portland. 95% of the vehicles spawn right in front of the garage, making it really effortless. I did have to go out of my way to another area to get a specific car, but even then, when I got all the way from Portland to the Shoreside garage, a kind fellow was waiting to commandeer my car, and he put it in the garage for me. Man, some friendly people in the city. Shoreside is good to go, and will allow me to spawn any vehicles I delivered to it. The only vehicle I needed for Portland was the Dodo. Oh yeah, this bad boy gets up, you just watch. <clears throat> Come on dude, don't be shy. I understand why they originally nerfed all the in-game airplanes. The September 11th attacks and all that was happening around its release back in 2001. It still would have been nice to get the restored Dodo in this edition without its wings being clipped. Stick with it long enough and you can actually make some magic happen though. With the delivery of that dodo, I've completed the Portland exports. The selection here is alright, these are more industrial type vehicles, nothing fast or fancy. Just two more are needed for emergency vehicles and I have a plan for those two at the very end. Making my way back to Shoreside, I went ahead and wrapped up my progress for the Furious First Responder Trophy by doing the last of the firefighting side missions. As for these Shoreside fires, these fires bro, they're coordinated. The cars are just catching on fire in the same areas on the same street. It's so ridiculous and I love it. As compensation, I'll get a flamethrower and a trophy delivered to my house for all my contributions to the medical, law enforcement, and firefighting career fields. The last RC Toys mission is all that's left. It's a good palate cleanser for all the craziness I've had to deal with up until now. I'll be awarded with the Man Toys trophy for completing the final mission. 
let's wrap up this game story with all that out the way. Ray needs our help. The you know what has hit the fan for him and he needs to leave the country. You'll be tasked with dropping him off at the airport. It's a time mission, so you have to be hasty. You can't take the bridge because it's heavily guarded. This leaves little chance of survival if you take this route. This mission is pretty easy if you remember one crucial detail, the tunnel system. It could get you to the front of the airport with little to no resistance. As a reward for dropping him off, Ray leaves some goodies behind for you in a lockup back in Staunton. Some weapons, a cash reward, and probably the best gift you could give a man, a bulletproof patriot. It's not damage proof however, so be mindful of that if you go on a rampage. The only contact left in Staunton is Asuka. She's been torturing Miguel this entire time and formulating her plan to disrupt Colombian operations. Beta is a simple mission. You lead death squad searching for you in Shoreside Vale to coordinate an ambush is set up by the Yakuza. The more challenging missions from this set would be Expresso to Go and SAM. Expresso to Go is simple in theory, but not really in execution. You have to run around and ram drug stands operated by the Colombians across the three islands, all while being timed. You don't know where they're located until you reach their proximity. The trial and error nature of this mission draws out its length. It's probably one of my least favorite missions in the game. Lastly, we have SAM, which is a solid mission. You have to shoot down a plane landing at the airport, take its contents, and return them back to Asuka while having a high wanted level. It's short when you consider that most of the mission is just the time you'll spend waiting around for stuff to kick off. We get a major development when we complete this mission. Upon returning the package to the construction yard, we see a ransom note. Catalina has killed Asuka and presumably Miguel while kidnapping Maria. She's holding her for a ransom of 500k. She wants you to bring the money to her villa over at Shoreside Vale. Before the grand finale, I swung over to D-Ice and did his mission chain so I could save the Catalina mission for last. Out of all the phone missions, his is definitely the most lacking. I understand her placement because it matches the pacing of what the other islands gave you. They just feel underwhelming considering all you had to deal with up until this point. Especially the derivative ones like Uzi Money, which is just a reskin drive-by mission, or Toyminator, which is a large-scale RC Toys mission with higher stakes. Rig to Blow and Rumble are passable, but don't really add anything new. Bullion Run is probably the most unique with this weight mechanic it introduces. The ice wants you to gather loose platinum scattered on the streets and deliver it to a garage. The more you collect, the slower you go. This also attracts the cops, so you have to balance grabbing the quest items and dealing with the police. Alright, everything is pretty much caught up story-wise. The only thing that's left for us to do is save Maria. So Claude visits the compound, gets stripped of his weapons, and drops the money off as requested. Of course, Catalina is not one to be trusted in any capacity, and that doesn't change now. To no surprise, she decides to have you executed. Claude suddenly triggers Ultra Instinct and kills the executioner though. So as soon as the mission starts, I get my 25th trophy for getting a kill with this pistol. It was the only one I needed to have at least one kill with every in-game weapon. Once we escape the compound, we see our ex trying to escape in a chopper. She's going to the dam to fly around it instead of just leaving town. I'll go down to the entrance and work my way to Maria. Here's where patience is crucial. Before advancing to different parts, you gotta know where you can be attacked from. Killing these enemies is a nightmare if you're within their attack range. There's a clutch sniper rifle pickup that helps you out tremendously until you can get your hands on some more powerful guns. Those chopper bombs will mess you up instantly too. Eventually, you'll get your hands on a rocket launcher and put an end to all this. Finally, it's over. Claude reunites with Maria while they make their escape. In the background, you hear a news broadcast. It's recapping the events of the final mission. Maria goes on and on about different things while she and Claude walk off into the smoggy, polluted, metaphorical sunset. The last thing you hear is Maria complaining when all of a sudden, it's interrupted by this sound. <laughs> There's been so much discourse about what this means, we don't see anything happen, just those sounds. Many believe that Claude killed her to shut her up, some think that it was the developers putting in a random noise. Rockstar has never really given a straight answer about this. Truthfully, I don't know what to believe. It's something ambiguous that I think is really just left up to your imagination. I love seeing everyone speculate on what it could be though. Completing that mission will award us with our 26th trophy. Only two more to go for the platinum. All we need to do now is get a combat related trophy and finish the imports exports for 100% completion. The combat trophy is killing 25 gang members with a combination of fists and or melee weapons. I went to the Diablos turf in Portland since they're the squishiest with their bats and easily got this trophy. 
The only two cars I need for the imports exports are the FBI car and Rhino. The FBI car is the most challenging to get your hands on because it only spawns under a 5 star wanted level. Mind you, there's 4 agents in these cars, all with M16s, so if you're not careful you can easily die. I got my hands on one of their cars by bottlenecking the police at the Portland safe house and using my collected police bribes to ward them off quickly. Nice, just one more vehicle before the platinum. The locked Rhino at Phil's place actually becomes unlocked once you beat the story so I easily acquired it. I went to the docks to drop it off, but not without causing a little bit of chaos first. And as we deliver our last vehicle, I just wanted to thank you for making it this far. It took roughly 18 to 19 hours to 100% this game. I love it so much, which is weird because it's not the best GTA or even my personal favorite. In a parallel universe, I've always wondered what this GTA would have developed into if it was the third one to come out instead of the first one in the trilogy. Nonetheless, I have a soft spot for these older games and I just appreciate them for what they are. Timeless masterpieces. I want to do videos like this for Vice City and San Andreas to give them their spotlights because they're phenomenal on their own merits. When exactly will I get to those games? That's to be decided. This this video took a lot of effort to produce and I know that the other two games will be even bigger projects. Until then, I could catch Claude up on all the GTA lore, I have to tell him about Tommy, Carl, well you met him in 92, remember that, it was a pink slip race you guys did, that crazy bitch hit his car with a crowbar, alright, so check it, there's a whole multiple universe thing, like a different Liberty City, but like modern and pretty, sheesh, where do I even start with that, okay, so here, let's just do this. Señor Dickhead.